guest today. I, uh, I, I like to say good evening for everyone. Uh, I have been to Denver uh, a couple of years ago and it was, I had very good memories, but this time because of the Corona, we are doing this uh, on YouTube and Zoom, which is a good opportunity, but I miss to see my friends there. <laughs> So uh, it is, uh, I'll try to uh, explain uh, as a journalist who lives in exile for last four years because of the destruction of Turkish democracy, how that happened and how a country, a democracy could be destroyed in five, six years, which is not a long time. So when you consider uh, Turkey, uh, we should remember uh, that it is uh, a country uh, with 80 million population, a majority Muslim, uh, 99%. And it is uh, at crossroads uh, of Asia and Europe, like a bridge. It is the only Muslim country, Muslim majority country in NATO, so it sits in a very rich history, goes back to uh, Roman times or before Rom Roman. And uh, Istanbul, for instance, was the capital of East Rome and the Ottoman Empire for centuries. So it has a great culture, great history. Uh, even it shares some legacy of the Greek civilization, which is seen as the source of whole Western, uh, modern uh, Western world. So uh, with this potential, Turkey uh, was uh, an important candidate to be a, a bridge uh, between the West and East or between Christian world and the Muslim world. Uh, and uh, when I uh, was an uh, active journalist in Turkey, especially in early 2000, uh, I was so much excited to see that Turkey was getting very close to uh, that role as a shining uh, democracy uh, in, in, in the area, in an area which is neighbor to Russia, Iraq, Iran, uh, Syria, uh, and some other countries which are always on the news with very deep and very awful uh, conflicts. So it would be a great success uh, for, for Turkey, and it could be a great contribution for the whole world if Turkey could do that. But uh, it's very strange and very sad that the, uh, the Turkey's political uh, trip, let's say, or the destiny, which started in uh, 2002 by the, uh, by the, the current uh, party of uh, Erdogan, which was pushing Turkey towards uh, to be a better democracy or even a member of European Union uh, and doing a lot of reforms in, term, in terms of uh, politics, in terms of economy and uh, in other uh, fields. At the, under the same party and under the same uh, government of the same person, it became uh, one of the very uh, authoritarian uh, countries and many, many people, many politicians, many political scientists call it uh, uh, author not just authoritarian, but a kind of dictatorship. Although there are elections, although there are opposition parties different from a full-fledged dictatorship, but many issues are decided by one man. So uh, I, I'll try to explain how this happened and why uh, this happened. And uh, I became a witness indeed to that 
transformation from becoming a model of Muslim democracy and uh, becoming at the headlines of newspapers all over the world, from Japan to France, from Canada to Britain, and then to be seen as one of the uh, worst countries, a populist uh, authoritarian uh, country in the last uh, five, six years. So what happened? So uh, indeed, uh, my career as a journalist and uh, Erdogan's career as a politician has some parallels. When I started uh, in uh, early 90s to be a reporter at uh, Zaman Daily, which later I became the editor in chief, Erdogan was running to be mayor of uh, Istanbul. It was in 1994. And he was describing himself as a political Islamist. So what does political Islamist mean? Turkey, as I said, 99% Muslim. What is the difference between Islam and political Islamism? So political Islamism is an ideology derived, derived from um, uh, Islam, uh, but is a, a vari variation, an interpretation of Islam, which uh, aims to control uh, state power, the government power, and impose uh, their understanding of religion uh, to the society from top down. So this was uh, seen in many uh, ways. As there, there has been, of course, they believed in uh, democracy in the sense that the ballot, ballot box was the way to come to power. So there's a very famous quote from uh, Erdogan from those years, uh, early 90s, uh, who became a mayor of Istanbul, uh, said uh, that democracy is a, a streetcar or tramway. You use it until the destination you like to go, and then you leave it. So this was uh, his earlier uh, idea uh, about democracy. And uh, about the Turkey's relations with the West, with the European Union, uh, his political party was not fond of that, was not supporting this idea of Turkey to be part of the European Union. Instead, they were saying uh, Erdogan and his uh, party leader at that time, saying that uh, European Union is a Christian club and Turkey has no place in that. So with that uh, ideology, with that perspective, uh, he became, I mean, he was successful as a mayor, although he had such uh, ideas in terms of uh, political perspective. And before him, uh, there was a social democratic party uh, in, the, in, the, in the administration, in the management of the city, which was very unsuccessful failed badly. So Erdogan shined greatly because of his success uh, as a mayor uh, in Istanbul. And uh, there has been a very important development uh, towards the end of his uh, term. Uh, he was jailed for four months just because uh, reciting a poem. So who jailed them? Who jailed him? Uh, the political establishment or the bureaucratic establishment, which uh, saw him as a danger, as a threat to secular notion of Turkish uh, Republic. So they jailed him. Uh, and this was a short time. Uh, but as a result of that, uh, his political life ended. He was banned to form a political party or to run to be a, a MP or something like that. But that made him a big victim in the eyes of especially the conservative parts of the religious, pious parts of the Turkish society. And then uh, in, in the uh, early uh, 2000, he, he was uh, rising as, a, as an important figure as a very important political figure, when uh, he founded his party, 
together with some of uh, his friends. They named it AK Party, which means uh, white, or uh, they promised to fight uh, corruption. And because of that, they said they, they meant to be clean uh, party. So it was promising justice, democracy, progress, and fighting against corruption. So with these promises and with being a victim of um, uh, the secular establishment, uh, which is very highly represented at, in those years in the judiciary and in the Turkish military. So uh, he, uh, after, after he got out of jail, he said he changed his mind. He's no more a political Islamist. He is a Democrat. And he, he promised to uh, make Turkey a member of European Union. And for that, he promised a lot of uh, reforms in terms of democracy, human rights, media freedoms. And that uh, attracted my attention. And that started uh, support of a lot of people uh, in Turkey and around the world. So we had, a, we had a debate among ourselves, whether should we trust to those words that he changed his mind, or we should suspect uh, that promise uh, he makes. But in, uh, until 2010, I mean, in 2002, they, uh, they won the elections, parliamentary elections, and they came to power and they did a lot of uh, reforms and Turkey was almost joining European Union. They were making uh, negotiations to join. A lot of reforms has been accomplished. And uh, in those years, Turkey was an, an, exemplary, an exemplary country uh, around the uh, world. And it was appreciated by Muslims uh, in the Middle East and by the Western uh, intellectual world, by, uh, by the media. For instance, he was uh, on, the, on the phone, one of the top five leaders to be on the phone with Obama. You know, when Obama was elected, he paid his first visit, one of his first visits to Turkey and made a, a speech at Turkish parliament to support that success, that a Muslim country could be uh, also a democracy uh, and uh, it could be successful economically and could be an example for the rest of the Middle East. If you consider about the rest of the Middle East, which is in turmoil, you know, I mean, surrounded with a lot of conflicts, authoritarian uh, regimes, etc. So, uh, but this uh, this story, this is a very good story, of course, a beautiful story. This did not continue, uh, sadly. Uh, especially, uh, the things started to uh, change after 2010, which was the peak year of uh, his power and his um, popularity. So uh, there has been some uh, important changes uh, which uh, led him to have bigger control on uh, military, the secular establishment and judiciary, uh, which uh, freed, uh, released him uh, to pay attention to those kind of concerns. And uh, I mean, the, the European Union orientation uh, was an important uh, idea, an important project to check, uh, to control uh, the establishment, the secular establishment. But when, uh, when he became powerful enough uh, to control them, uh, so uh, he did not uh, want to continue uh, with that orientation. So he turned back almost to his earlier uh, ideology. And uh, there has been uh, two turning points in, in that uh, period. Uh, it is after, uh, in, at the, in the summer of uh, 2013. Uh, this, the first one was the, the Gezi protest. Uh, since Turkey was still uh, seen as a model of democracy, uh, the Erdogan government decided to have a, to 
uh, it construct a shopping mall uh, in a, a green park uh, in Istanbul, which uh, has a limited uh, space uh, in terms of uh, green uh, parks. So there has been a lot of shopping malls and people, especially young people did not like uh, that project and they started to protest and they were expecting uh, the government to listen to them because Turkey was seen, as I said, as a democracy, as a rising democracy. But instead of listening to them, uh, Erdogan ordered police to crack down the protesters very badly. Even some people, some young uh, people at the age of uh, eight, nine, uh, even uh, were killed during that uh, crackdown on the protesters. So that was a big shock for uh, people who were supporting this uh, government and Erdogan uh, as, as seeing him as an opportunity to make Muslim Turkey a better democracy. So it was also a shock for the whole world. So there was a very uh, a, a interesting uh, event in at the peak of the Gezi protest, which became widespread uh, and got to whole uh, cities of Turkey. At the at the at the peak uh, at one of peak time of uh, the Gezi protest, uh, CNN International, BBC, whole international media was covering because, as I said, they were shocked what's happening in Turkey. Uh, I mean. The, these pictures and the videos were very much in contrast with what we were what they were thinking about uh, Turkey. Then, then, but at the same time, Turkish uh, news channels, uh, what, for instance, one of them was CNN affiliated CNN Turk uh, TV channel. They were broadcasting a documentary about penguins, penguins. So it was so strange, you know, the uh, CNN International broadcasting the protest, but the CNN Turk broadcasting a documentary about uh, Penguin. It's not because they did not know that this is nonsense, but because they started to have phone calls from uh, the office of prime minister. At that time, Erdogan was prime minister. So Erdogan was trying to curtail and control uh, the protest uh, by, um, limiting and by threatening sometimes uh, media to stop uh, showing all those uh, anger of the people. So that continued uh, for a while. Uh, a lot of uh, columnists were fired uh, upon the calls from uh, Erdogan's office again. Uh, so uh, Erdogan at that time uh, showed that uh, his, uh, his dedication or his, uh, his understanding of democracy is so limited. So at the end of the same year, there has been the, the second turning point, which was the corruption investigation at, in December uh, 2013, which revealed uh, that Erdogan uh, and his government were uh, getting bribes in order to help uh, Iran to sell its oil to uh, world markets, which is under international sanctions and under American sanctions. So an Iranian Turkish businessman called uh, Zarab uh, was paying bribes to uh, a lot of people at the, in the government. And uh, the corruption investigation revealed all this and the whole media covered uh, this uh, investigation. Of course, uh, that angered uh, Erdogan further, and then they started to get, the government of Erdogan started to be more uh, um, authoritarian uh, against, against the uh, press freedom, uh, expression of any criti critical ideas became uh, a, a big uh, reason to fear. Uh, I mean, there has been a lot of court cases against journalists, a lot of um, a lot of people were a lot of columnists uh, again fired from uh, their uh, newspapers, and in those days, uh, our reporters were uh, able to go to the press conferences and asking uh, Erdogan the questions about his corruption or the authoritarian uh, tendency. Uh, 
uh, and Erdogan was saying very harsh words about those uh, about our reporters. So a couple of weeks that continued, but and then Erdogan cancelled press cards of our reporters, and he called uh, boycotting the media, the critical media or free media, not to buy their newspapers, not to purchase advertisement from them, and sending tax inspectors to put pressure. Uh, a lot of threats and a lot of court cases. There were some days that I was busy with uh, lawyers more than uh, our reporters to defend ourselves. Some, some days, our 20, 20 reporters uh, were called to be uh, in court uh, by, by accusations of ju just related to doing journalism. So that, uh, that, uh, that change, uh, of course, uh, increased gradually. And be between 2013 and until 2016, until 2016, there has been three years of harsh struggle, at least for me and for a lot of, a lot of critical uh, journalists in, in Turkey. So uh, Erdogan was uh, not able to silence uh, whole media, these critical voices. And he, when, when he started to control judiciary, uh, he found another way. So what was it? Uh, it was to uh, make some court decisions to appoint trustees to the uh, boards of media companies. So in this way, uh, the new trustees were appointed by the government, of course, and they, they uh, when they uh, came, when they came, they came brutally because uh, people, uh, the, the former boards and the journalists did not like uh, this. They saw it as an intervention uh, to uh, the freedoms, their freedoms. And they came with the police force and uh, occupying uh, the media headquarters and then fighting uh, journalists uh, and then uh, hiring the mouthpiece uh, reporters or editors uh, to their places, to their positions. So with these uh, steps, for instance, I, I, my newspaper was uh, occupied on March uh, 4th, 2016. And this, the other day, on the 5th of March, 2016, I was fired. And a lot of uh, journalists uh, were uh, fired. I mean, maybe more than 20 uh, news channels, TV channels uh, were uh, silenced uh, they, they were occupied as they as Erdogan government occupied my newspaper so this were these were all happening uh, before this notorious coup so when coup happened uh, in this coup attempt uh, July 15 again 2016 so that gave Erdogan another um, excuse to silence opposition further so on, uh, the coup happened on the 15th of July. My home was raided on 27th of July. And a lot of journalists and reporters and columnists, uh, their homes were raided and arrested. Luckily, I left uh, the country three months before. So when they controlled, when they uh, took over uh, the newspaper and fired me, I, I had the chance to leave the country under uh, some cautious uh, ways. So I was not uh, there. So I, I was not arrested, luckily. And I, I, I'm free, although I am in exile. But a lot of uh, our uh, friends and journalists, reporters, columnists are uh, in jail. And this is not uh, just from my newspaper, but from uh, from very different uh, newspapers with different perspectives. There are some Kurds, leftists, liberals, and uh, the accusations against my newspaper was double because we were critical journalists, but at the same time, we were affiliated with the Gulen movement, with the Hizmet movement, which was uh, labeled as a terrorist group uh, before, even before the July coup, uh, the coup attempt. So, I mean, uh, this, this uh, trajectory of uh, events uh, every day, as I said, uh, got worse. 
And when you look at uh, the Turkish jails now, it is not just full of journalists, and it is not just journalists uh, in jail, but uh, academics, doctors, uh, teachers, housewives, even babies. So it, it, the business people uh, as well. So I just want to uh, underline a very symbolic two persons. Uh, one is uh, Ahmet Altan, who was a prominent uh, journalist and a novelist at the same time. And Haluk Savaş, uh, who was uh, a professor uh, and who was a, a psychiatrist. So uh, the Ahmet Altan uh, was editor in chief of uh, Taraf Daily, uh, which was supporting Erdogan government when it was under pressure uh, from the secular military establishment, when they were trying to make some coups or some judicial ways of stopping uh, Erdogan uh, government's reforms in uh, between 2002 and uh, until 2010 or 11. So uh, Ahmed Altan was supporting uh, Erdogan strongly against this military uh, incursions or inter interventions. So uh, Ahmed Altan uh, himself, despite the fact that he was one of his supporters in his worst time, in his difficult times, he was arrested uh, in uh, 2016. It must be in uh, September, just because of some of his words uh, that uh, the courts decided that he gave some subliminal uh, subliminal support to the coup. So this was the accusation. So they gave him life sentence just for that. So Ahmed Altan. So he was in jail for uh, uh, until uh, recently, and there has been some changes in the appeal process. He was released uh, finally, but uh, after one week, he was uh, out of jail. He wrote a, an article uh, about uh, his cellmate, who happened to be a person with the last name Gulen. So be, just because of that article, he was jailed back again. So still Ahmed Altan is in jail. So this is a very prominent journalist uh, story. The other is, uh, if you can see in the picture, Ismail, can we see the pictures? Uh, that's, that's okay. So the other is Haluk Savaş, as I said, is a professor uh, of uh, psychology who was teaching, has a lot of books and has nothing to do with any terror or any radical uh, things that any government can accuse. But after the coup uh, in uh, July 15 coup attempt, uh, so uh, a lot of uh, academics were purged from universities. 18 universities were shut down and 7,000 academics, professors, uh, doctors, associate professors were uh, purged and fired. This professor, uh, Haluk Savaş, was one of those uh, 7,000 uh, academics. So he was in jail and uh, there has been uh, accusations that he also was affiliated with the Hizmet movement. And he also supported the coup attempt. This was the claim against him. But uh, in the jail, while he was in prison, uh, there has been, uh, he, he became ill uh, with cancer. So finally, there has been, again, the appeal processes. And then he was released uh, from jail. And then the court cases, uh, the, the, even the Erdogan courts uh, decided that uh, this professor is innocent, but they did not give him uh, his passport to be able to go for a treatment uh, in, uh, in Germany, out of uh, country. So for weeks, whole Turkish uh, uh, people who believe, believe in democracy 
made social media campaigns and a lot of noises uh, to get the passport of a professor who was uh, proven to be innocent even at the court of Erdogan to go to, uh, to Germany. So finally he went uh, to Germany, got some treatment, but this treatment, of course, uh, is very late. He was released from the jail very late because of the passport. He was not uh, let uh, go to uh, the hospital in Germany. And because of all these delays, uh, his, uh, his uh, cancer became uh, detrimental. And then uh, last week he passed away. So there are similar stories of journalists, academics, teachers to be jailed with silly accusations of being part of the coup, supporting the coup or being part of the, the Hizmet movement uh, and uh, facing such uh, terrible uh, situations. With, with, with all those, I would uh, like to uh, show you the uh, the statistics, you know, I just mentioned two persons, uh, Ahmet Altan and uh, Haluk Savaş, but it is not limited to that. I mean, there are different figures, but uh, we know that at least 130,000 people were purged from uh, the public services. So these were teachers, academics, judges, prosecutors, lawyers, so you can imagine, just 33,000 of them are teachers and 30,000 of them are police officers, a lot of soldiers. I mean, unbelievable uh, figures uh, of um, the human rights uh, violations. Of course, when it comes to media, uh, there is an institution in, in New York uh, which reports and records uh, the press freedom problems uh, all around the world. It's called CPJ. According to them, uh, Turkey uh, is uh, one of the worst jailers of uh, journalists. So it is seen next to China, Iran, and Russia, Saudi Arabia, those countries. And when you look at this uh, international uh, press freedom uh, index, you could see Turkey is ranking 154 uh, out of 180 countries. So a, a terrible uh, situation when you, when you look at the figures and the uh, statistics and the stories of uh, violations and the limiting democracy and freedoms. And when, when, when we come to uh, this uh, scope of it, it is not limited to academics or journalists or uh, police officers or judges. The purge is also uh, including politicians. For instance, in Turkey, there is the third biggest opposition party, which is called uh, HTP. Uh, it is... Uh, it mainly uh, supported by the Kurdish people uh, in, in Turkey. So eight MPs from that party are in jail now. The leader of that party is in jail, Selahattin Demirtas. Last year, uh, in March, there was local elections. And in those local elections, that party, that, that Kurdish uh, party won um, 65 municipalities. So 65 mayors in different cities, very important cities like Diyarbakir, Van, and some other Mardin cities in the eastern part of Turkey. But in one year, I mean, from March 2019 to today, 53 of them are sacked has been sucked, have been sucked from their positions, fired, purged. Some of them are in jail. Some of them uh, are uh, at large in the, they having their court cases. So this is, this is, the, uh, this is the situation which is 
which, uh, which I say, whoever is uh, objecting or criticizing uh, the Erdogan's line of thinking or his policies faces consequences. Either if, if they have media, their medias are shut down. If they are journalists, their journalists are jailed. If they are in the public service, they are fired, jailed, or uh, exiled. So this is, this is, the, uh, this is the situation uh, that uh, it is even almost impossible to describe the scope of all the uh, tragedy. So I can say hundreds and thousands of people each day struggling for basic rights. And all these are uh, happening uh, in a country which is member of NATO still, and it is part of all um, uh, Western institutions, European Council or OSCE and everything, and has a history of uh, Westernization, modernization for last 200 years. So that's a very um, uh, gloomy uh, or uh, dark picture uh, of a country which is transforming from being a promising democracy or a rising model of Muslim democracy into a populist, a populist uh, autocracy in five, six years. And uh, as, as I, I mean, uh, I, I can say uh, two things. One about how, how is the Turkish people's reaction to that? I, I like to show you a poll, a very recent poll. Uh, what is the support of, uh, what is the level of support among uh, Turkish people to Erdogan's party and some other parties? So if you can see the, um, the, the poll result, which was uh, in a couple of weeks, it's very new. So when you see it, um, Erdogan's party is at the top still, and it has 30% uh, uh, support. Main opposition party uh, is uh, a social democratic or little center left, let's say, party. It has 24%. Uh, the, the, the third biggest opposition party whose leader is in jail, HDP, has almost 9% support. And some other parties. But I like to underline, uh, I like you draw uh, your attention to two parties, which are uh, a new development. It is the Deva uh, uh, Party. Yeah, it is in Turkish, but we can uh, see it uh, with the support of 1.9 and the Gelecek, which means future, uh, future party uh, with the support of 1.4. So these were uh, these are parties that founded by uh, Erdogan's very close uh, associates. So one, uh, uh, the leader of uh, Deva was the finance minister, economy minister of uh, Erdogan government for a long time. So he left uh, uh, the party, AK Party or Erdogan, and formed his own party. The other party, the Gelecek Party, is the a party founded by Davutoğlu, who was the chairman of AKP, Erdogan's party, and became, he was uh, once prime minister of uh, Erdogan. So this is the new development. Uh, and there's also, uh, still, as, as you can see, still not promising, still not uh, showing that uh, the, the, the power uh, or the government can change. This is the tragedy of Turkish democracy. And uh, also the, the problem in, in Turkish history, we, we were not never, uh, we were never a perfect democracy. We were almost always struggling to be a better democracy. But the, the problem, the threat to democracy in the earlier uh, years was coming from the, uh, the bureaucracy, especially from the military. So Turkish people used to have military intervening for a couple of years and then going back to barracks. So this was the uh, very important problem and constraint <clears throat> at top of, uh, on top of Turkish democracy. Uh, but now the difference is 
uh, there is a uh, popularly elected uh, party which is the source of uh, authoritarianism, which is the problem of destruction uh, of democracy. So that is that is very new. So <clears throat> that is that is very new. But uh, one promising, despite all these dark picture. I like to underline one small uh, sign of hope. I don't know if if my they could uh, agree with me on that. Last year, in these uh, local elections, uh, the mayors of Istanbul and Ankara these are two very important cities. Istanbul is more than fifteen million. Many many people say that Istanbul is equal to Turkey. So. Uh, in that city, uh, the, uh, Erdogan lost elections and lost very badly. And uh, in the first election in the March, uh, the, the opposition candidate uh, was running against the former prime minister of Erdogan, Binali Yildirim. It was a <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> it was a neck and neck race. I had a problem with my <clears throat> voice, sorry. So Erdogan, uh, the opposition won the election, but Erdogan did not accept the result. They canceled it through courts. And there has been a rerun two months later. And in this rerun, uh, the opposition candidate won uh, the election with uh, 54 against 44, with the 10% change which is very, very significant, uh, which gave a lot of hope uh, to people <clears throat> that Turkey uh, can, uh, can go back to democracy if uh, it is a possibility. But uh, is it possible? Uh, is it a real expectation to think that Erdogan can lose an election and transfer power peacefully? We can talk about uh, about that. Uh, maybe you can have questions about uh, this point or some other points. I can I can uh, try to uh, give my uh, answers. Uh, Ismail, can can we stop here to for some questions? I hope uh, we have yes. some time for questions. Yes, of course. Yes, thank you, thank you, Fadiji, for sharing your thoughts and your experience with us. Um, was very interesting um, um, hearing listening to you. Um, so the first question um, I would like to ask is, um, you talk about Turkey, and we know Turkey is very important due to its geopolitical situation um, as a NATO member um, for the United States. So what can you say about current Turkish-American relations? I mean, we have seen that Erdogan had a close relationship with um, U.S. President Trump. Uh, I read several reports that he could call Trump and um, he's being just handed over uh, to him immediately. Um, and we have seen that some prosecutors in the U.S. have been replaced, some speculated upon request uh, by Erdogan to President Trump. So what can you say about this relationship and what can you, um, what do you think is going to be the future of US-Turkish relations? Of course, two countries has very strong relations, especially since the Second World War uh, under the umbrella of NATO. The Turkish army got a lot of support from, uh, from America, from NATO. When, uh, when the Soviet Union uh, threatened Turkey, uh, so uh, that, that, that was the beginning of the relations uh, between Turkey and America in the last uh, decades. But nowadays, uh, when I look at the relationship, I see there is, I mean, the relationship is limited to good relations uh, between Trump and Erdogan. So I don't see that uh, in, I, I live uh, maybe 30 minutes to Washington. So I had the chance to talk to a lot of people from very different backgrounds. 
So I see that in Congress, uh, the, the Congress from both parties, from Republican and Democrat parties, are alarmed to the direction of Turkey, both in terms of destruction of democracy and in terms of its foreign policy. So uh, just one example, for instance, let, let's say just two examples about the divergence between the relations uh, between two countries. You know, Turkey is a NATO member and it is supposed to act friendly uh, and in accordance in good relations with, with NATO members, including NATO, including uh, United States. But Turkey decided, uh, Erdogan decided to buy Russian missiles, uh, S 400s, despite all the warnings from uh, NATO and from America. And the second thing is, you know, when uh, ISIS became an important uh, headache for the whole world, including Turkey, America, and every civilized person on earth. A war started against uh, ISIS, and America was uh, leading a coalition of countries in that fight against uh, ISIS, or, or called Islamic State. And in that fight, the local forces that helped America was Kurds, the Kurds in Syria. But Erdogan attacked those Kurdish groups, despite all the, again, warnings uh, from, from America. So uh, why? Because uh, Erdogan uh, saw, or Turkish government, were seeing those Kurds as extension of uh, Turkish PKK terrorist group. But they were allies of America. So it was very, very delicate, very difficult relationship for both sides. But uh, despite, uh, despite that uh, sensitive nature, Erdogan did not listen to those warnings and uh, started uh, an attack against the Kurds in Syria, which helped ISIS in, in many ways. And Erdogan stopped that uh, war against uh, the Syrian Kurds, when, when Congress decided to put some sanctions, which included an investigation about the family wealth of Erdogan. So because of that threat, Erdogan stopped uh, that attack uh, against Kurds after doing some, uh, some internal incursions into Syria. So uh, the relations, uh, as I said in the beginning, dependent on the uh, interesting positive chemistry between two leaders, which is, uh, which is not supported by Pentagon, not supported by State Department, not supported by American media, think tanks, Republican Party or Democratic Party. So, which is a big risk in my view. So the relations should be uh, more uh, broad-based and it should not be uh, dependent on just uh, two persons' uh, good chemistry. Thank you. Um, so um, in one of your previous slides, you explained how the story actually is. You talk about the center left party, you talk about the Islamists, the Kurds and so on. So we can see that there is various different um, sectors and active roles, players um, in Turkish politics and society. And if we combine all the opposition, one might think that they could actually um, win an election together as, um, as coalitions. But unfortunately, we are not seeing much solidarity among um, opposition parties or oppositional groups. What is the reason for that? Why is this happening in Turkey? 
So it's a pity uh, there is a struggle between whole opposition and Erdogan, we say palace. And also there's a very strong conflict between each parties in the lines of nationalism, in the lines of how to see religion's place in public, in society, or how to uh, develop relations with Kurds, you know, those kind of issues dividing uh, the opposition among themselves, which is a big frustration. But little hope about that again uh, is the last uh, local elections in 2019. So I, I mentioned this as a promising sign. Uh, when the opposition won election, the opposition candidate from the CHP, the main opposition party, uh, with a very big margin after years, after decades. So that victory was possible because for the first time, because of two things. The one thing is, the one of them is, uh, for the first time, uh, three main opposition parties came together and they, they had a consensus on being, having uh, support, having, giving support to the same uh, candidate. This, this is very important, which, uh, which was this, I mean, very productive in terms of uh, its result. And the second thing is the main opposition party for the first time was able to control the ballot box results. You know, uh, uh, I was the director of Jihad News Agency uh, when I was in uh, Turkey. So our news agency was an important source of giving, uh, I mean, uh, the, the real time uh, election results from each ballot box. So this was a kind of counter check to the official uh, data coming from the, the AK parties or the government's control. But Erdogan destroyed that agency as part of the destruction uh, to free media. So in last three years, I, would, I need to underline that 200 media outlets were shut down, including that news agency, including my newspaper and a lot of uh, radio stations, websites and TV stations. So uh, the opposition party, the main opposition party always uh, were weak to get the results from uh, the uh, election, uh, from the ballot boxes, but this time they were organized enough to control, to get their own data. And Erdogan tried to uh, intimidate and tried to force the official result, as you would remember, as those Turkey followers will remember, they said, we won. This was the, the trick that they were repeating every time in uh, several elections in a couple of years ago. But for the, for the first time, the op main opposition party has the control, has the, they had all the information, all the data from each ballot box, so they objected. So out of that objections, it was possible at least for rerun the elections, and of course, uh, since a legitimate election was uh, canceled by uh, the ruling party, there has been a big reaction. Even some Erdogan supporters uh, maybe changed their idea and uh, supported the opposition candidate. So that's a very important uh, lesson for opposition. But this is a big challenge for Turkey. I mean, Turkey still could go back to democracy only if opposition can learn these important lessons that they can only win elections when they can come together. <laughs> Otherwise, Erdogan is, I mean, he's in power since 2002, 18 years, you know. I guess uh, America changed three presidents during that time, <laughs> maybe more than that. So he learned a lot of political tactics. So he can play uh, both ways, you know, the carrot and stick very well. 
So <laughs> if he if he can feel that if he can feel that he can buy a politician, he can buy. It. If he feels that he can't buy, he jail him or her. So with those divide and rule tactics and some international policies, even you know, uh, in America people debated this Turkey's incursion into Syria as an as an international issue, but it was an extension of this domestic politics. So when uh, Erdogan attacked Kurds in Syria, it became very difficult for this opposition alliance to come to to continue their solidarity because there is there was also a nationalist party so they also see kurd uh, somehow negatively at least those kurds so because of that it helped erdogan to divide the opposition in a way but will it help uh, erdogan to continue to uh, divide them until the next election uh, i this is an open question still so this leads us to a follow-up question. Um, so let's say Erdogan lost a nationwide election, not just a municipality election. Do you think Erdogan would respect those uh, election results? So this is this is the biggest uh, challenge for Turkey, in my view, and I am very pessimistic about that. Uh, why? Because uh, since uh, 2013, since this Gezi protest and the corruption investigation, Erdogan uh, is staying in power, not with legitimacy. Maybe he's still getting some support from uh, people because he controls 95% of the Turkish media and a lot of other tricks he, he can uh, employ. But this is not a rule with legitimacy. So can you imagine there is a corruption investigation in December uh, 2013, and all the evidences are so uh, valid and so strong. I don't know. I don't know if we can go to detail to that much detail into this remi reminding to our um, listeners that this corruption investigation brought to America very strangely. And the same case was opened in New York. This, this uh, Iranian, uh, American, Iranian Turkish businessman was at the target of FBI because uh, he was helping Iran to, uh, to avoid uh, sanctions, international sanctions. So he was arrested in New York, in Miami, excuse me, and then tried and he pleaded guilty and he confessed all the things that all the bribes he paid to the ministers of Erdogan. So the same case seen uh, in, in American courts and the evidences are so strong, as I said, there is no doubt about that. But what happened, what Erdogan did, <laughs> this ministers and any all people accused in that investigation were released and to their place, the judges, police officers, and investigators were uh, jailed. So they are still in jail for, for six, seven years, for six years, a lot of uh, judges, prosecutors, and the police officers who were involved in that corruption investigation in jail. So if, 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 you are, uh, if your power depends on destruction of legitimacy and rule of law, you can hardly accept transferring power and uh, go back to your uh, home or to your uh, grandsons or grandkids to have a retirement life. So because of that, uh, of course, this is just one thing. This is just about corruption. A lot of people, there are people killed in the jails under torture. There are a lot of people killed in the uh, terrorist attacks that are very much questionable. What was the source of those uh, terrorist attacks? Hundreds of people. So because of that, uh, I think it is impossible for Erdogan to accept 
a smooth uh, democratic transfer of power. That was possible last time in 2015, when Erdogan's party lost the majority in parliament and they were trying to form a coalition, but Erdogan did not like it. Erdogan at that time was president and his prime minister was Ahmet Davutoğlu. He was trying to sincerely to form a coalition, but Erdogan did not like it because a coalition would be a challenge for his authority and it will be dangerous for, uh, for his, uh, for out of claims that are uh, covered up about uh, his uh, wealth of his family and uh, a lot of criminal activities that uh, he is uh, part of. Just, just a little part is his support to the jihadi groups in Syria, for instance. So there has been a lot of, in last five, seven, six years, there has been a lot of crimes that is uh, very difficult for Erdogan to uh, accept uh, for, a, uh, as I said, the democratic transfer. If, 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 it, if it can be done, it would be a big, a good, pleasant surprise for me. Yes, yes it would be, I agree. Um, the next question would be about a very current issue in Turkey, and it would be probably in interest of many Christians. As we know, there is a holy site in Turkey called Hagia Sophia, which used to be the largest church in the world established by the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, after the conquest of um, Istanbul or Constantinople, it was um, transformed into a mosque. And with the establishment of the modern Republic of Turkey by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, it was transformed into a museum. Right now in Turkey, there is debates about um, transforming it back into a mosque, which is making a lot of Christians upset. And people are wondering, what is Erdogan's agenda? Why is he putting that right now on his plate again? Can uh, you say is, a few words about that? This is only political. You know, if, you, if, you, if you can please uh, uh, share this poll results, I would explain with that. And if you can uh, share to the screen this poll result, which shows uh, Erdogan's party has 30% support. <laughs> so this is very much an extension of that poll result. So uh, this 30% was 49, 50, 45% a few years ago. So because of this, uh, uh, destruction of democracy, free media, and of course, as a result of that Turkish economy decline. And on top of that, we had this uh, COVID uh, crisis and all of them culminated into a very uh, poor performance and very big uh, reaction from, uh, from Turkish people. And uh, Erdogan's popularity is decreasing every day. So he tries every mean to fix it. It is not easy to fix. So this was one of his last cards. So by that, he tries to uh, manipulate uh, or use or misuse uh, the nationalist uh, and the pious people's feelings. Uh, I mean, uh, when, when someone uh, sees uh, Turkish TV channels, especially these TV serials that are controlled by government, as I said, 90, 95% of media is under Erdogan's control. And uh, Turkish TV serials are not just popular around the world these days, but very popular in Turkey. So many people's minds are shaped, uh, and, or at least uh, they have a, a very important impact on the shaping the political views uh, of the people. And in those, Erdogan uh, uses uh, very smartly, uh, he equalizes himself with the Ottoman sultans. You know, there is a, a, a Abdul Hamid, who was one of the last sultans of the Ottoman Empire. So 
he tries to equalize himself with this sultan. So he gives the uh, impression uh, by uh, military uh, incursion into Syria or military operations in Libya or through those uh, TV serials that he is reviving the Ottoman Empire. He is making Turkey greater. So this is a great leader. And since he is such great leader, whoever is uh, criticizing him, he, it is he is or she is, whoever he is or she is, acting against Turkey's national interest. So uh, they are the spies of America or spies of Israel, or they are acting in the interest of Europe. This is, this is how uh, Erdogan and his, the media under his control portrays things. So this, um, uh, the attacking PKK, for instance, or the Kurdish uh, groups in Syria uh, is another uh, card that he is playing to, for the national, nationalist uh, sentiments. And the other is this, this uh, uh, the converting uh, a museum into a, a mosque is also part of that agenda. I mean, you cannot see that as one of the party's promises in their party programs. So why we are debating about that? And in the, I mean, it could be opened. Uh, it, I mean, that change could be done, but is it, should it be made part of a political play? I mean, Turkish people could come together, talk about it, talk with the international uh, allies or friends and can make a decision out of that consideration. But it shouldn't be part of the uh, petty politics. This is what I see now. And this is so saddening. So anything could be used this is my understanding. Anything could be used if it can help Erdogan's popularity. So there is no, no limit uh, in that. So uh, last couple of questions before we close. Um, you mentioned the name of an important player in Turkey that is right now not existing anymore as uh, at least it's not visible anymore the Gulen movement and your newspaper was um, uh, affiliated with the Gulen movement. The Gulen movement um, or your newspaper was supportive of the Erdogan government until 2010, 2012, until it turned uh, into um, a despotic regime. Um, so why do you think did Erdogan choose um, the Gulen movement as a scapegoat? Because right now we hear um, that the Gulen movement is behind everything. Anything that goes wrong in Turkey, the Gulen movement is being accused of that. So why did Erdogan pick exactly um, the movement to do that? Uh, you know, uh, when, the, when the movement, uh, when the Hizmet movement was supporting uh, Erdogan, while his government was doing right things, while whole democratic world was supporting Erdogan, the Hizmet movement was supporting that. But at that time, there was a polarization in Turkey. At that polarization, the opposition parties were not happy uh, with what Erdogan was trying to do. You know, because Erdogan was trying to reform a, a very authoritarian, secularist, hardline almost secularist republic into a democratic republic. And the, uh, the opposition parties, including and the mainly the main opposition party, was not happy with that. So in those in those years, we were debating, uh, for instance, uh, if girls with headscarves can attend to universities. Can you imagine? And those parties, especially the secularist parties, were uh, thinking that this is just normal. I mean, a civil servant a police officer, a teacher cannot wear a headscarf. A student, a, a, a girl cannot wear a headscarf uh, at a university. This was the debate. So because of uh, that nature, because of that polarization of the time, they did not like 
the Hizmet movement to support Erdogan. So they were accusing that you are together against us, against the secular values of uh, Atatürk Republic, etc. But the Erdogan and the Hizmet movement in this society, Erdogan uh, in the politics, were indeed trying to reform Turkey, trying to make it uh, similar to any European country. So this was the aim. This was the reason for their um, interaction or uh, alliance, let's say. But at that time, <laughs> this Hizmet movement's support to Erdogan got the uh, hatred or the dislike uh, of the opposition. And uh, so there was that 40% uh, were not happy with, with the Hizmet movement already. So when Erdogan made this U-turn from democracy to uh, a despotic rule, an authoritarian uh, rule, and he did that because he got corrupted. He did that because if you are corrupt, you don't like a free media. If you are corrupt, you don't like an independent judiciary because they will question you. Both will question you. A prosecutor will question you, a journalist will question you. So Erdogan made that U-turn. And in that U-turn, he used Islam, religion, as a cover. Even to that extent that when, this, uh, when there was a, a, a raid to a uh, chairman of a bank in whose home there was uh, lots of uh, dollars, you know, hundreds and thousands of dollar piles in the shoes, in the, uh, in the book, in the shoe cases. So Erdogan and his uh, media's defense was we we collected we put that money to there to open a religious school. Can you remember? Do you remember Ismail Bey that? Yes, yes, I remember. So, I mean that that is a very symbolic example of how Erdogan used to cover up. Uh, I mean his corruption and the authoritarianism that emerged out of that corruption. And uh, of course, Hizmet movement made the biggest crime when they did not they did, when they did not approve that corruption and use of religion to cover up those things. So there has been some uh, Muslim scholars who were very respected before. They made some other decision. They legitimized corruption. They legitimized corruption, and while the Hizmet movement, uh, starting from Fethullah Gülen, who is living in Pennsylvania in exile in his 80s, very uh, senior uh, person, and who was mean, uh, at the, I mean, meanwhile, who became the victim of every authoritarian turn of Turkey, whether secular, whether uh, uh, populist whether uh, Islamist. In all these authoritarian times, this uh, guy, uh, Gülen, became the victim. He, be he was jail in jail, he was in hiding, etc. This is a long story. But there's a very good biography which says each 10 years, Gülen is in jail because of his uh, turns in the Turkish uh, democracy or the down downwards of Turkish uh, democracy. So, uh, the Hizmet movement made the biggest crime by not approving Erdogan as an Islamic leader, not of Turkish people, but of whole world. Now, Erdogan had such dreams as well. He feels, and some of, uh, you can see it uh, uh, from uh, some of his associates, that they see him as the leader of the, as the caliph uh, of whole uh, Muslim world, if not the whole world. So uh, he liked uh, the, the Hizmet movement with its all network, especially in Turkey at social level and at the world. You know, you, you should remember that there, there has been 100 
80 countries that the Hizmet movement is active. They had schools, charities, hospitals, a lot of things. So the uh, Erdogan wanted uh, this uh, movement to approve uh, his uh, the, the leadership uh, status and the corruption and authoritarianism. Uh, when uh, when the movement, uh, for instance, our newspaper, which is affiliated uh, with the movement, we were critical of uh, uh, this corruption and authoritarianism since uh, 2013, since the Gezi protests. The Gezi protests was a turning point for uh, our editorial uh, line. Maybe we were a little late here. We could start. We could have been started uh, earlier, maybe at 2010. We can have a lot of, uh, we did a lot of mistakes in that regard. I, I have a lot of self questions. Uh, I, I am learning a lot of things, meanwhile, uh, from our mistakes. Uh, but this is the reason. So, I mean, when you, when you, uh, when we turn back to the, uh, the first part of my explanation, why the opposition hates the Gulen? They hate because when Erdogan was doing good things, uh, the, the movement was supporting uh, Erdogan and opposition was not happy with those things. And then when Erdogan turned back uh, against the movement, so the circle completed. So 40%, 50% were already hating the movement. And then 40% uh, support, let's say, Erdogan has. They started to be uh, against the movement. So then you have the 80, 90% of society against uh, this movement. And then that gave a golden opportunity for Erdogan to use to, you know, each authoritarian government in the world in the past and today needs a scapegoat to make people fearful and to legitimize the authoritarian despotic policies. In Hitler, this was the Jews. And in Turkey, this is the Hizmet moment. That's a very bad uh, very pity, but this is what it is. So you can you can see the oppression against the Hizmet movement very similar to uh, what happened in Germany during the Hitler time. I mean, minus uh, gas chambers, we can say. Of course, I mean, but a lot of people are dying not in gas chambers, but under torture. Yes. Yes, I mean, it's very unfortunate to see the dehumanization of peaceful people and some scholars to refer right now to what is happening in Turkey, the movement is, is a genocide. Um, so that term is coming up more. Um, so for our listeners who consider themselves as allies of Turkey, who like Turkey, who love Turkey, can you give them some advice about how they can support uh, the democratization again of Turkey. What can Americans do to help Turkish people to, be, to become a democracy? So first of all, uh, let me make something clear that I am not an anti-Turkey anti person. I love Turkey. I am against, I'm not against Turkey, but I am against the authoritarianism. I, I am against the autocracy. I am against dictatorship. And I love my people. And I love Turkey. And uh, Turkey is Turkey is not equal to Erdogan. Uh, Turkey is rich in history, as I said in the beginning. I mean, when I, live, when I talk to Americans, I see that they love Turkish food. Uh, so Turkey is very rich in uh, culture. It's a very, it occupies a very strategic, geostrategic location. And it is, it is only the Muslim uh, NATO member. So uh, there are lots of valuable things that makes Turkey very important. It is neighbor to most critical uh, countries uh, in the world. Uh, so uh, we should never uh, equalize, first of all. Uh, Turkey to Erdogan. Even if I am oppressed, even if I am exiled, I try to uh, be less emotional in that. I try to be more realistic. So, uh, as I said, it is a gloomy and a dark picture, but there are also some 
uh, signs of hope as the last year's local election, as the declining support to Erdogan, despite all the control of the state government and the media and everything. You know, can you imagine? The, the judges decides about an issue and when there is an opposition or when some people in the ranks of AK party or the Erdogan's party don't like it, they change the decision in a couple of hours. They had to. So despite all that total control, that poll is so promising. So the support to Erdogan is not increasing from 30% to 40 and then to 50 and then 60. So it is declining, which means Turkish people are open to new ideas. And that support, uh, that change of mind, especially is very visible in metropolitan areas, in big cities. We are talking about Istanbul, Ankara, Izmir, Bursa. So in last local elections, that was very clear. He is very. He is still powerful in countryside, in Anatolian uh, cities, in the uh, maybe mainly rural area. But in urban areas, he is losing uh, the power. But uh, not to lose the government, he is uh, creating new alliances with very strange uh, partners, including his former uh, main enemies. So this is uh, who Erdogan. So first thing is not to equalize Turkey with Erdogan. The second thing is to be candid and open to criticize. You know, you may be an academic in America or you may be a diplomat or you may be a, a, a normal uh, citizen. You should not uh, neglect that Turkey is, uh, Turkey is important. You should not uh, see Turkey an unimportant uh, country. And uh, there is always a way to, to support uh, democratization effort or Turkey going back to democracy. I say that there is, uh, there is the first human rights dimension, you know, suffering of that many educated, talented people is not something to be accepted. You know, we are not talking about the oppression of people like the Uyghurs in China or some other people in Russia. This is happening in Turkey. This is a NATO country. This is not acceptable. So this is the human rights dimension. But the other dimension is strategic, geostrategic dimension. So as Turkey gets authoritarian, it gets closer to Russia and China and Iran, some other countries. So when Turkey stays democracy as democracy, or when it goes back to democracy, Turkey would be a better partner of democratic world. So this is the geostrategic dimension. So this should be always kept in mind. And I am critical of both Obama administration and Trump administration in the, in the Turkey policy. Obama did a lot of good things when he supported Erdogan, when he was doing good things, when I was also supporting Erdogan. But when, he, when Erdogan made the U-turn, Obama was not quick to understand that this Erdogan is not the same Erdogan that he was supporting. So Obama was so slow and even so important uh, in uh, stopping, in telling candidly Erdogan that you cannot destroy democracy, you cannot shut down TV channels and newspapers and then come to White House to meet me. <laughs> this happened. This unfortunately happened. And that, that continued uh, with, uh, with Trump administration, because Trump administration uh, had developed very strange relations, family relations with Erdogan and some people around Erdogan. Uh, even uh, a, a prosecutor was fired in New York because of the request coming from Erdogan, which is a shameful thing, which is, which is, which is a betrayal to American uh, values, the values of uh, and shouldn't in the constitution. You know, the independence of judiciary, freedom of media, all these are very important cornerstones. Whether you are Republican or Democrat, we should be, uh, we should be protecting those values as citizens.
you know, we are before we are a party member, we are citizens. So that the unfortunate things uh, happening, and uh, I, I, uh, I mean, as the government can do that, politicians can do that, the uh, the academics can do that. You know, can they can do a lot of things. There are academics who are doing petty jobs in in Turkey. So the universities can invite them. They have PhDs from very prominent universities around the world. So there are journalists who are uh, uh, struggling to survive. So there are lots of things. Uh, of course, the most important thing is to remember uh, and not forget uh, people who are persecuted, innocent person, people who are persecuted uh, in a NATO country. This is not acceptable. And we, we, we shouldn't be shy to say that. This is not to be, this doesn't make you anti-Turkey. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Billy. Um, it was um, a delight, uh, very interesting, and very painful at the same time to listen to what is happening um, in Turkey. Uh, but you gave us hope. So we are waiting for a change, hopefully. Uh, hopefully in the near future uh, with perhaps an upcoming election or um, elections the Erdogan is going to call. Um, so thank you a lot for being with us tonight here. Um, thank you. We thank hope you that we will see you. Yeah, we hope to see you soon sometime in Denver after the pandemic <laughs> or in Aurora um, hopefully I would, so that I we would... can... I would love to do that, and I thank you and thank the both institutions for inviting me and all of your uh, uh, participants who had the time to listen to uh, such little sad story. Yes, thank you, thank you, and we hope to see you soon. Take care, and um, to the listeners, um, if you are lis interested in um, listening and hearing and um, our upcoming events you can go to our website uh, we're going to post our upcoming events soon and at the same time you can subscribe to our mailing list which is on our homepage. and the same is true for our friends from utah um, you can go to the emerald hills institute's website and you can subscribe to their events have a good night and um, enjoy the upcoming weekend thank you good night